Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Victoria. I'm the project lead for PECAMA. Um, so today's webinar is organized by us and also by Cosmonauts. Uh, so PECAMA is uh, an IP intelligence tool. Uh, we are a docketing system, a budgeting system, as well as a community. Um, so today we are back uh, with our fifth webinar. Uh, we have Vincent here, uh, as well as Shirley. I will ask you both to introduce yourself. Uh, Shirley, if you would like to go ahead. Yes, hello everybody. My name is Shirley Weiser. I'm an IP uh, attorney, uh, practicing trademarks and uh, patents. Uh, and I am an in-house IP manager as a freelance for several companies. Thank you. And Vincent as well. Yeah, hi guys. So my name is Vincent Couteau. I'm, I'm a Belgian national, been working in IP for more than 20 years. Actually living by an adagio, uh, I firmly believe that if you don't find IP, IP will find you. And I'm not saying that because I'm an IP practitioner, but I truly believe that if you're conducting business of any kind, uh, well, you need to be sensitive on the topic, otherwise it may end up uh, on your table in, in a more, um, in a more uh, unpleasant fashion. And actually the reason why I went into IP was because of, of, of an epiphany. Um, when I was working at the tech transfer department, uh, I saw the power of IP in uh, dentists. Well, there was a use case applied by dentists to uh, to civil to the civil engineering domain, because dentists are used to uh, to apply biomineralization, so pushing bacteria in our mouth to fix teeth, and basically. They started talking to construction engineers and they applied this method to fix the cracks in um, in bridges. That's where it all started. I am uh, I've been through m many companies, also at the bar, uh, managing a sizable trademark portfolio. Today and and uh, actually my role encompasses transactions, which is a bit larger than trademarks. But uh, we will obviously pick. Um, uh, pick your brain most of the time um, on the patent side. Um, so uh, I will be talking more about uh, trademarks today. Thank you. Uh, it's very true. Uh, I think IP comes in uh, in everyone's mm. life one way or another. Um, uh, we are actually, this is why we are also want to discuss uh, cost control. I think uh, in the last year, especially, um, with COVID, um, I think companies and inventors as well are more cost conscious. Um, and it's, it's uh, time to have a bit of discussion about how, uh, how you can control your costs during the patent and trademark applications. Um, and we'll also steer the conversation a bit towards the entire life cycle at one point, at one point. Um, and uh, as you both mentioned, we'll be approaching the discussion from both the patent and the trademark uh, perspective. Uh, Shirley, with you talking mostly um, about the patent side, um, and Vincent, you, you'll be mentioning mostly the trademark side, but I know that you both have experience uh, uh, from both perspectives. So, um, you know, we'll be, we'll be discussing that. Uh, and I kind of wanted to start off with a more general question uh, at the beginning. In your experience, uh, what do you think the most successful way uh, of controlling costs within, uh, within an IP department is? Um, so both from the, uh, let's start with Vincent uh, for now. Uh, sure, Victoria, thanks. Um, well, I'm gonna bring a story um, as an in-house expert, so forgive me if I don't delve into the legal details. So I'm not going to bring a, a legal practitioner's uh, side here. But as far as I can tell, and it, it may be a bit classic in terms of message that I'll be conveying, but you you actually need to try to do less more with less, <laughs> not less with more, but more with less. So it's really about trying to 
get where the business wants to what's wants to reach in terms of objectives and then try to to deploy the right set of actions so sometimes this may lead to actions that look a bit straightforward but let me give you a couple of examples so uh, as far as i'm concerned we've been trying to file less trademarks that sounds that sounds obvious right because if you file less, you will have less costs. But also, um, we're of the opinion that, uh, well, new trademark projects uh, should be kept at a minimum. So in our process, we are, we are actually uh, scrutinizing a lot of things. And there's a lot of boxes that need to be ticked like, is there is there a bud, sizable budget that we that we plan to to sell in terms of offering of product or product? Uh, do we actually need a trademark and so on? Um, there's a general trend in the IT industry that really goes tends towards generic and descriptive names, and and we're trying to capitalize on our main corporate trademark and uh, one of those elements in there that we filed as a standalone tr trademark. It's it's um, actually what we call the Atos Globe. And you can compare it with the with the Nike swoosh or the Vodafone teardrop. So we're kind of putting that center stage and really uh, capitalizing on that one and then trying to deploy a, a naming structure that is smart and that uses generic or descriptive names that also speak to the mind of people. And, and whether you're in B2B or B2B2C, it's really not needed to come up with a original name for every product, every platform, every software solution that you sell because usually you're selling an, an, an offering, a whole offering as a service. And that's why uh, this is the way we've been deploying our actions and, and try to be smart. Also, in my experience, and um, I will hand over to Shirley afterwards uh, to talk about patents, but for me, filing a trademark is really like opening uh, a Pandora's box. So if you want to go there, you better be prepared because there's a lot of challenges ahead. So very often, if we can avoid filing a trademark, we will do it. And of course, just like with patents or with trademarks, we will have our defense strategy ready. So uh, on the generic and the descriptive name side, we will have our whole storyline ready to make sure that whenever we get we get some uh, C and D letters in, that, that we have a, a solid storyline. But then when the business uh, case uh, allows it or demands it we do file but we will try to file file smarter um, and it will save in it will save cost but will have a better impact as well um, but perhaps i will pause there and and hand over to shirley because i think we will be talking about filing strategies uh, later yes shirley Okay, so this is a very challenging question that uh, you were asking, Victoria. Uh, how to take something quite expensive uh, and try to control the costs. And it's ongoing, you know, that all the process of uh, filing and the examination of uh, patent applications take years. So my answer is in three words plan your actions this is my answer to this huge question plan your actions plan your filing budget once you want to file a new patent application ask your patent attorney for a quote for drafting the application and then your patent attorney will be able also to give you the expected costs uh, for the upcoming three years after the filing. Uh, there are requests for examinations to be filed in several countries, renewal fees in some other countries, and other kinds of formalities that can be foreseen. So ask the question, the 
get the answer and plan your actions. Once you want to national phase your application, then make a choice, uh, a thoughtful choice of the list of countries you want to national phase file your uh, patent application. File in countries of business interest. Uh, here I also have some uh, anecdotes of people, or of uh, entrepreneurs or inventors uh, that I ask, where do you want to file your patent application? And they say, in all over the world, of course. <laughs> then, no, you will not file normally in all the countries in the world. You will file your application in the countries of business interest according to your business plan normally i mean i've never met a situation uh, that requires uh, so many filings in all over the world another way to save some costs uh, in filing is uh, before national phase filing we may we have a chance to amend the pct claims in order to reduce the number of claims, especially in countries that charge for excess number of uh, claims, and to render the claims more applicable and to conform with the local requirements of every country we file the application in. A, a question I'm frequently asked about is how, if we can reduce the cost of translation in national phase filing and my experience is that although this, this cost may be reduced by uh, using a, tra a translating agency and not the patent attorney, this is the kind of cost I would not try to save and do uh, ask the patent attorney, the local patent attorney, to translate the patent application because it has to go through examination and it should conform the, termino the terminology and the language uh, of, the, of the patent application. Uh, obviously, uh, planning our actions also go through planning uh, the renewals. We may decide every year what kind of, what, what application will be renewed which will not be renewed if we abandon or withdraw application. This gives us another way to control the costs. And there are also renewal agencies that they provide some reduction in costs if the instructions for renewals are provided a year ahead and not just case by case. This is something that I suggest uh, to check. So plan your actions. Thank you. Uh, yes, I think it's, uh, you know, when you have an inventor with a smaller number of patents, they usually don't expect uh, the costs and, and they don't really plan ahead either because they just think, uh, you know, it's, it's a one-off thing or, uh, but it's actually very important and, and, you know, we also, whenever we work with attorneys, uh, we are trying to partner up with firms that uh, also do IP strategy, for example, um, just because we know that when it comes to the IP owners, this is uh, also something that's very important. Um, and when it comes to the cost itself, uh, one way, uh, again, to kind of save costs is perhaps the patent prosecution highway as well. Um, this is something that allows the clients, if they have a patent in one jurisdiction, to accelerate the handling of the same one in different jurisdictions. Um, and I think you have another version of this in Israel as well, Shirley. It's uh, the Section C, 17C of the Israeli patent law. Uh, and have you seen any difference in the cost for the IP owners uh, since it came into effect? Uh, yes. Personally, I didn't because this uh, amendment to the law was introduced in, 19, in, in 1995 and I was not uh, <laughs> practicing yes. patents at that time. Uh, but from uh, si since I have been practicing patents, then I'm quite certain that this section 
does this save uh, lots of costs. Why? Because it's not only PPH, Patent Prosecution Highway normally uh, puts the applicant uh, in a better place in the queue for starting the examination. But the Israeli law uh, uh, sure, uh, enables to grant or to allow the claims that have been granted in other jurisdictions, in other countries, such as Australia, Russia, Europe, Canada, and the US. And they are likely to be accepted, provided that they conform with the local law, because there are things that are not patentable under, under the local law. And they provided that the applicant asks for acceptance under this shortened procedure. That's why the applicant should better know that there is such an option and try to use it. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you. And Vincent, do you think there should be something similar for trademarks? Uh, uh, I know that uh, the trademark procedure, application procedure is not as long or I guess it's complicated, but uh, in terms of costs uh, or efficiency, do you think it would make any difference? Well, if you allow me, I, I will just emphasize that uh, from an in-house perspective cost reduction as such is not a is not the holy grail so it's not the only goal uh, we have i would rather look at the ratio between cost versus impact that would probably be a better assessment criterion and of course as um, we don't have bph like things uh, for we don't have faster turnaround times or um, for trademarks like uh, we have for patents but um, there are ways to for instance use the international filing system the madrid system in in certain ways to uh, sometimes in combination even with national filings to to have the best uh, impact uh, but l let me just dwell on that for a second so um what I wanted to say is that um, for me, there are a bit of quick wins in, in the filing strategies that you can apply. Um, you, especially small players should consider looking at public subsidies. It, it's, uh, it's amazing sometimes what subsidies you can use. Um, then other really simple tips and tricks to apply is try to go for grouped filings uh, when you can. Now for the EU, it's obvious, but you can also file into the Andean region in, in, in LATAM and, and have a bundled uh, filing into m more than one country. Same goes for French speaking Africa when you go for an, an, an OAPE filing, for instance. But then also in the digital industry where I work, it's it's really commonplace to not go all over the place. And uh, there I'm kind of piggybacking on what Shirley said. Um, you can get really far if you first, first inform your, um, your business contact about the cost. So for trademarks, a global campaign will cost 300K approximately and then we we're not talking about the afterburners so that that's quite a sizable um, budget and of course as you said surely everyone wants to be everywhere but it only makes sense to be in the, in the major jurisdictions and then you will you will be sufficiently positioned on on the global checkers board to to counter strike uh, wherever you need to be, so that it's a whole story of, you know, cross cross licensing and and cross crossing rights. But another simple tip, uh, and and I will uh, perhaps elaborate on the Madrid system and, and cost savings just a bit later. Try not to go into really expensive countries if you can avoid them, like. Uh, any Middle Eastern country is, is hugely excessive. It's also because most of the filings there are usually single class filings. So if you want to target, uh, I don't know, a trademark over four classes, it means you need to, to file for, for trademarks. Um, now, obviously, if, and if you have to go there, 
try to stick to one class being the most pertinent one. And, and even in multi-class filing, sometimes a, a fee applied by an office includes a certain number of classes. Um, if you overshoot the, the number of classes, you're going to have to pay more and the premiums you know, are, are quite, uh, quite important. So try to target where you, you know, try to get, get your, your, your shooting, your shooting, um, direction, uh, pointed, you know, in, in, in the right way and don't overshoot, just go try to narrow down to the classes you need sometimes to the descriptions that you need. And, um, then when using the Madrid system, the international filing, um, as most of you know, you can you can use it in parallel with the base local filing that can be EU as well. And then you can e initiate uh, the international filing with the, e the, the WIPO. And it's, it's going to lead to a lower fee. Of course, your international filing will, the, its life will depend on what happens with the base filing for, for uh, during five years. So if the base filing is abandoned, then you also the international filing lapses too, but but since you're allowed to file in one language, English, French, or Spanish, you will save a lot of, of costs, notably translation. So as said, there are lower filing and renewal fees, but, and that's where actually the story is a bit mixed and we need more nuance. Uh, national offices have started to uh, recalibrate in the sense that they tend to raise more objections against international filings designating their office. And admittingly, this happens uh, for protective uh, reasons because uh, in a nutshell, national filings require to mandate uh, local representatives and it means it just creates more work for the national offices. So. They're kind of not happy with seeing all those international filings with designations coming in. But so the system is there, it's useful, it has its flaws, especially since the local offices are kind of, um, you know, recalibrating things with the objections. But if you use it wisely, you can target certain countries in the list of 121 countries to designate. You can still have the same priority filing uh, within six months, but you can further add to your designations after this six months period um, without the priority date, uh, obviously. But it will generally save you costs when you use the international system, albeit that if it raises more objections, this will add costs. So you will need to see where you do that. Um, as I said, you don't need you don't need a local representative uh, necessarily to handle your international uh, filing. Uh, but as I said, the protectionist stance taken by the national offices um, is somehow carving out the benefits of this um, of this system. And then, um, in conclusion, it's a good system, but it doesn't work in all countries. So for countries that are a bit more protective like US, India and China, uh, be careful. And at least that's my experience. Sometimes if you have really important projects, you're not even thinking about cost savings only. All you want to do is make sure that your trademark will be accepted. And sometimes it really means combining both an international filing, a filing sorry, with a designation and a national filing. So, um, because as the as the saying goes, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. If you have a really important project, you really need to use all the weapons you have uh, at hand. So finally, when using the international system, um, without going too much into detail and depending on the countries, using the Madrid protocol, which is a different uh, subsystem as opposed to the Madrid agreement can, can also uh, save you some, uh, some money. 
also when you know you will be targeting some countries with your international filing try to make sure that that your description of goods and services is kind of um you know jurisdiction proof for all of those um because that way you will avoid refusals I'm just saying this because in the international system you have less bandwidth to kind of adapt your description of goods and services so um if you if you make it more generic uh and and you make it fit to to stand you know an, an asian a european a us and african uh, examination it it is going to help you to avoid uh, objections and 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 all types of office actions that that obviously trigger more costs because uh, i'm sure surely will confirm uh, in the trademark arena like with uh, with patents the most costs you have are, are at the prosecution side handling the the office actions and the oppositions so plan your actions plan your budgets um the biggest trap is to face huge unanticipated costs that are linked to refusals. Um, um, in my experience, 50% of your filing budget will be consumed by refusals in year two and year three. And Indian, US, Asian designations of an international filing will always trigger objections. Um, I hope that answers uh, your question. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I also wanted to just uh, draw the audience's attention to the chat box. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'll be uh, I'll be asking those at the end. So uh, you know you're welcome to ask uh, anything from us. Um, and on this note, so you both mentioned uh, using the international system to sort of save costs and also just not file where you don't have to. <laughs> Um, on this note, you know, there's also the uh, idea of slowing down the patent procedure. Um, do you think that when it comes to bigger costs, does it help to, uh, to, to control the cost at all? Um, Shirley, perhaps. Uh... You have options to slow down or also to speed up the examination in uh, some countries. So it depends on the currency and the budget you have. Uh, after all, the budget will be the same. Either you slow down or speed up. The, the slight difference of uh, extension fees will not make the big difference. Yeah, of course. Thank you. And I don't know, do you have, would you like to add any, anything, Vincent, or? I'm, I'm just thinking aloud and trying to figure out, but uh, honestly, in my practice, we, we have not come to such a stage where we're called to delay procedures or to win time for cost purposes. Um, this is just not part of my world. Uh, it, it, may be, it may be an issue for some other folks, but mainly, as I said, since, since we're, we're really trimming down on what we're filing, you know, we're only filing when there is a serious budget uh, business case, sorry, and, and, and when, when the business owners are aware of the costs and, and are willing to go there, open the Pandora's box and, 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 and go at war, um, then, uh, then we go for it, then we go for it. And uh, up to now, I don't think I have used any tactics to, to win time. Um, Obviously, we, we could consider doing that in when we're, we're on the defense side. Um, I am personally, um, I'm personally always very surprised when I see certain oppositions, uh, oppositions targeting our trademark filings. I can give you an example. Uh, Hyundai has a car that is named Atos. And so a uh, Hyundai executive was uh, launching really, really heavy attacks against our Brazilian filings. 
uh, whilst we are a, a company active in the digital space, digital domains so or high, high performance compu computing, cloud computing, all that stuff, nothing to do with a car, they were actually opposing our trademark filing based on their ex registered trademark in Brazil. And um, I've seen numerous examples like that. Another one was when I was at Worldline, we had Boeing, uh, they have this plane called the Worldliner. And they were actually really fiercely opposing our trademarks whilst Worldline is a FinTech. Um, so I think there are really strange there's really strange behavior sometimes um, that is demonstrated by companies, people, IP practitioners, where you, you're really questioning why they're going for a fight. So one of the ways, at least I try to save cost, is choose my fights wisely. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, if it rings a bell to you, um surely but uh, this is one of the essential rules when you're an in-house person don't do anything that has no use or impact do you get my point or do you have f familiar experiences yes unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> okay can, can you give an example or is that confidential uh, no, I will not give the example. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, it's, uh, you know, I think even from from an innovator, probably they don't really want to go into a fight. Uh, they just try to protect their innovation. Um, and I think we had this discussion yesterday, Shirley, as well, uh, that you've mentioned that they usually come in and they just, are very much in a rush and just wants to kind of get over the patent procedure. Um, and do you think there's a way on how to create a focused meeting with with uh, your patent or trademark attorney when it comes to the client? Uh, yes, certainly. So we're changing the subject uh, completely now. <laughs> yes, moving on. And once we have, uh, I, I just told you yesterday and can tell the, the attendees here that uh, sometimes I get a call from an inventor say asking my assistance in a, a drafting a provisional patent application. So I ask, have you approached already a patent attorney? And it, uh, just last week I had such a call and that uh, inventor said, yes, yes, I tried to, to contact and I, I was talking to a patent attorney but she asked me for so many details. It's, it is such a burden. So I don't want to work with her. Can you help me in a way? So, uh, yes, you ha we have to make our exp expectations before meeting a patent attorney. And as an inventor, I have three points that I want to advise that, that you prepare before meeting your patent attorney. First of all, please write down your invention. Just write it in your own words. Uh, when you write it, uh, you focus, you, you describe, you better describe your idea. Once you wrote your invention, then the second point is make a search, your preliminary search of the web. Just Google the main words the keywords of your invention and see what comes up. Has anyone thought of your invention before you? Or once you read, of course you have to read the search results and compare them to what you are coming up with and see if there's still novelty in your idea or maybe you can just uh, focus better your idea. The third thing is that please test your idea, make a model, try your invention, see that it works at least in one embodiment of it. And once your invention is written, you, are, you have an idea of the prior art upon your own search and you tested your invention and you know that basically it works, then it is a good time to contact your patent attorney 
and discuss more specifically on how to continue. Okay. Thank you. And Vincent, uh, do you have anything in your experience uh, where something similar to this? Or do you think, uh, would you like to add to, to Shirley's uh, um, explanation as well? Uh, of course, yeah. Uh, maybe just very fast, the, the, there was one tactic that, that I forgot to mention before on the international system. So one, one thing that can also help is to choose your base country wisely. So if you choose that, a country where your examination on absolute relative grounds is less strict, you will have a, a faster and an easier approval and that reduces cost because, because of course, as we know, the base filing in your international procedure will determine how, you know, how successful you, you will end up to be or how fast you will end up to be in, in your designation. So uh, I, I forgot to mention that. But then when talking to your trademark attorneys, uh, it, it's really um, a matter of collecting as much information as possible from, from the business point of view and just trying to associate your, your trademark attorney because, uh, you know, I'm an in-house lawyer. It's impossible for me to stay abreast with all the nitty-gritty details of what a trademark attorney can do to either speed things up, reduce costs, have a greater impact uh, or success rate. So it's really impossible for me because of the of the workflow. Uh, there's, there's so many, you know, projects uh, in, in terms of, trademark filings, licensing deals, uh, and so on that we need to handle. So we really need to to rest upon uh, uh, upon the, the help of the uh, trademark attorneys. But the more we feed them, it's important to spend time collecting that information. Um, when was the first use? Where, where do we intend to sell? How much? What's the prospective sales in the next three years? Um, have you heard, have you heard of any competitors using similar signs? Uh, because very, very often when we get a new trademark project in, uh, surprise, surprise, uh, we find out that the direct competitor is using exactly the same. And, uh, and, and so the business approaches us with the, uh, in a bit of a tricky way, you know, saying, oh, we came up with this in an independent fashion. Uh, um, this is the product of our brain work and uh, we think that's a great catchy name and uh, they, they never, maybe it's just subliminal, but, I, and I hope they're not doing it on purpose, but, <laughs> but, but they must have heard or seen it somewhere. And then for some reason it surfaces in their mind and they, they're thinking like, oh, this is a catchy name, we should file this. And, and, and of course, you can you can use all sorts of search strategies to to kill those crazy trademark ideas. And, and you know, there's a lot we can do actually with with basic searches. Uh, you know, everybody can 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 do that, and we do that in the team as well. Um, but usually, um, you know, our trademark attorneys. What we try to do is really try to make them familiar with our business. And it takes years because for a trademark attorney that is handling, you know, pharma companies where labeling is extremely important or, uh, I don't know, uh, B2C companies, you know, toy companies, whatever, it's very different to have, to treat uh, trademarks of a digital pure player like the company I work for, Atos. I mean, a lot of what we do is only going to exist online and maybe only four or five to 10 years. So the usual software life cycle is, is 10 years. So the, 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 these are all life cycles that, that also impact the, um, how to say the, the trademark strategy. Very often we get some, some, some topics on, on our plate that are different like uh, quotes and taglines and 
um, all these things, you know, but taglines are difficult to, to trademark. And um, I guess we're trying, we're trying to push them as far as we can, try to make them intimate with our business. And that's where we come up with smart tactics like fi filing the ATOS globe, which we can use not only on lanyards on the, of the Olympic Games where we are uh, the IT integrator, but also now we use it in, in all our collateral online and offline. And um, we've not yet reached the stage of trademark uh, filing a trademark on a color or a, a smell. <laughs> But we, 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 we're really trying to bring that innovative factor because that's what we're facing, just like Shirley. I'm not only dealing with trademarks, but contracts, licensing, and, and, and transactions, and transactions can include patents and, and so on, and, and litigation. Um, so we're, it's tr really trying to create an intimate relationship in a nutshell. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, uh, we've driven away a bit from cost efficiency <laughs> yeah. um, to, to bring it back uh, a bit. Uh, how, how do you think technology can help uh, cost efficiency um, during the both patents and trademarks uh, filings? Perhaps, uh, Vincent, if you would like to start. Well, I, I would hope and expect that with the, with the advent of analytics, that um, examiners will do a better job, a faster job, and perhaps a cheaper job. Like, but maybe that's that's a futile hope because we know that uh, trademark and patent offices are really like cash machines. Uh, if you, if you look at the at the revenue that those semi-public entities are generating, this is quite dazzling. Um, so perhaps there, there is some hope on that front so that they will make trademarks and patents more accessible. You know, you have the our regulators, uh, especially in the EU, want SMEs to, to, to protect their IP much more vigorously. I would say that, you know, one of the base condition, basic conditions would be to lower the threshold. So that, that perhaps would be an option. And then, of course, technology can be used in-house in companies as well to better, to better anticipate um, the needs uh, of, of having trademarks or patents. Having better analytics will, uh, will probably help in that space. But it's going to take probably some more months and years for all those data to be to be trained and all those models to be to be fully operational. As you know, um, as we speak, you know, AI models are unable to break a CAPTCHA test, which is the the test we use very often uh, for very verification purposes. Um, so there's a long way to go. I think um, if if it may be interesting if you have yourself a large data lakes internally on, you know, the way you've been handling invention disclosures or new trademark projects, you could kind of think uh, about automating things internally. Uh, it, you know, instead of me just looking at the WIPO trademark search tools and, uh, or somebody in the team, you, you could, you could have, you know, very faster turnaround times um, and better print because for me, AI, AI's most immediate uh, value would be in the predictive, the predict predictive aspects, and of course, the predictive uh, feature feature or function can be applied to tactics, but of course, and that's the topic of today, to cost. And obviously, forecasting uh, is an interesting one, but it would require um, a lot of data pools and data lakes to be put together. So it, it would mean like, you know, companies with huge trademark portfolios like uh, FMCG or, you know, 
fashion companies uh, I'm thinking of to bring all those data together and have all those models trained uh, on, on those data and um, cross fingers this will happen one day and uh, it will then to be to the benefit of of all companies alike and especially the IP service providers thank you and then Shirley uh, first, I want to say that I do agree with Vincent, and I also normally uh, speak less about uh, saving costs in uh, uh, patent procedures and speak more and focus more on the value of the IP, because that's the whole point where we are uh, spending not, not very big amount, uh, sums of money in order to get a valid patent, that would uh, create important value for the company. The difference between launching a, a product which is patent protected and also trademark protected uh, is tremendously more important and creates a, a big value uh, comparing to a product that is launched and is not patent protected or trademark protected. I'm not talking about the risk of uh, infringing any kind of uh, third party's IP. So value is the term that I normally more focus about when talking about IP than saving costs. But because we're also here for talking about saving costs and saving costs is important especially for small businesses then i do agree i mean your question was if technology can help cost efficiency so a simple tool for comparing or for forecasting costs relating to ip and may assist, of course, in making thoughtful decisions. And I think it's a very good idea. Presently, I don't have such a tool, but I will be very glad to try one. I know I there are that. so many startup companies trying to develop some, such tools. And I do look forward to see an efficient one. It's not very simple to develop such a tool that will be user-friendly, uh, that will be updated frequently. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I, I agree with you, uh, Shirley, as well, um, that value is, is probably, it's, it is more important than, than being cost effective. Uh, but I think, you know, from working with some of our clients, uh, it's still a, a big part of, of uh, the process. Um, so I guess, you know, if you can have both value and saving costs, that's the best. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you also mentioned, Vincent, that, you know, and then usually as well, the forecasting of costs. Um, and one thing, one aspect of that, I think, is also historic data. Um, how important do you think that is uh, when it comes to, to cost control? Well, I, I think historic data can help with um, <clears throat> with with portfolio <clears throat> cleansing. Um, with that, I mean, and and I'm not, you know, for me, portfolio management is 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 a big source of cost savings, because if you if if you come just to make things a bit more tangible and concrete, if you look at a trademark portfolio that has built you know, built up incrementally over the years, you um, you will always find things to trim uh, and to clean up. So try to avoid doubling and tripling rights with national, international coverage. You would, it's amazing sometimes to see that you, ha you can have a French trademark here, you can have an EU trademark and, and, and there's no use of keeping the French trademark and you can drop that. Also, what, what I've noticed many, many times when we do acquisitions and looking at portfolios, just look at what is in there. Um, 
try to keep only word marks if you can. And if you're lucky, those are the ones with the oldest priority dates, but get rid of all the variants, all the logos. It's amazing how much variants you can have. You know, um, I'm talking about, you know, tens or even hundreds of variants. And, uh, and then it's really about checking the business use, uh, looking at what, what would be the best priority date, the oldest one to keep, to be on the safe side. And there's a lot, there's a lot you can cleanse and trim there. Uh, so, but of course it also means on the filing side, just try to, if you can try to file only, um, only verbal trademarks or black and white logos. And, um, you know, just simple tricks. Um, I don't know if you, if that answers your, your, your question. But uh, those are things I was I was thinking about, um, and then of course, yeah, focusing on value, as you said, Shirley. Um, the best way of not being forced into too many cost savings, and of course, you need to do cost savings. There's a lot of cost savings to do, but you cannot scrape a stone. Uh, I think the saying goes. So if you go too far, it's going to damage the company uh, in terms of positioning and you will only endanger your company and you, you will open avenues for competitors or other third parties willing to hurt you. But uh, if you look at the value and for, for trademarks and or patents, if you're able to convince your CFO, maybe finance people that a certain portion of the product you're selling or service you're selling is due to the IP. It means like, well, I mean, the, the whole cost conversation becomes different. Um, so from that point of view, uh, you know, looking at things as, as at IP generally as a profit center and, and trying to translate it into financial terms and that can also encompass revenue recognition when you do a license deal you know when you do a license deal you can sell a company people um, trademarks patents software uh, all those things combined well if if there is a dedicated value to to the ip it it, it brings up it, it shows the value and then your cost conversation is much easier um and I just want to finish with um, with an interesting experiment we did the la in the last three years around trademarks. And it was actually an idea of our CEO. And he said, we should try to monetize consent. So we get a lot of consent requests for companies that have trademarks similar to ours, obviously, when, when our corporate trademark is concerned, we're really you know, cautious to grant the same. And um, uh, either we don't do it, either we have, you know, used and registration limitations that, that are really uh, very detailed. But if we're able to give that consent, we've used that as a practice and we've been conditioning that to obtaining um, a, um, a consent letter which basically is a, com a commitment letter, a commitment given by the, the consent, the, the one who we grant consent to, that they will do business with us. So, and, and it's actually creating new leads for our salespeople. And that was an interesting experiment. So if, if, if out there, whether it's for patents or, or trademarks, anyone needs something from you, just try to monetize it. Just don't give it for free, but just try to get something out of it. All right, thank you. Uh, and Shirley as well. Um, I have one example about it of a CEO who uh, described a, a very uh, interesting innovation to me and urged me to file it as a patent application. And when I looked that the history of the files, I realized that exactly the same invention was filed years ago and abandoned two years before he asked me to file it again. He just forgot that we filed it 
uh, before and decided to withdraw as well. Uh, so having some tracks about history is important, uh, both for costs issues and for substantial matters. Uh, of course, it's important to know how much we paid for the same action last year and two years ago. And by this, it's another way to control and to, to check the present costs and to ask the question, why are you asking now this price? And two years ago, the price was different. Uh, and this is how I uh, practice history. <laughs> I don't practice history very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you for all of your answers. Uh, we have one more left, uh, which is kind of we've already, I think you've already answered this uh, throughout the discussion. You mentioned, uh, you know, that most of the time when someone wants to file, they want to file everywhere um, or, or that they fight, fight the, doesn't need to be fought. Um, so, but still, if you have anything to add um, to the question of, of, you know, where do you think that businesses go wrong uh, when it comes to controlling the costs of, of their filing? Um, so, Shirley, perhaps uh, if you'd like to start. Can you repeat your question, please? <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, where do you think businesses go wrong when uh, when it comes to their controlling the cost uh, when when it comes to controlling the cost of their filing? It's it's, it's getting late for Shirley. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, they can go wrong when you only think cost and not think value, because sometimes because because the value is much bigger than the cost, and sometimes the cost for for the short term. Uh, may look really big, uh, ten thousand dollars for or ten thousand euros for an action sound a lot of money, but then if you get an IP asset after this process and uh, it gives you value, then the value is about ten, about uh, ten times higher than the investment in the, in this field. So. This is the kind of uh, mistakes that uh, we risk to do. Huh? Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Shirley, because the worst mistake you can make is to compare apples with pears. And, and we, have, we have very sizable and proficient uh, procurement departments in, in our multinationals, but um, we always have to help these people because we as ip experts we know we know what exactly is embodied in the service and and what certain certain actions uh, mean not only in terms of pricing but in terms of of work um so it's really about try if you want to benchmark make sure that you're benchmarking the right things because otherwise you may end up, as Shirley said, making the right the wrong choice and you'll be saving money in the short term, but you will lose a lot of money in the longer term. So it's really trying to find a, seek the right balance between between I think uh, short term, medium term and long term and, and just mm -hmm. since we're since we're in a really strategic um, area of the business we cannot only focus on the short term and we've seen it with many many companies uh outsourcing uh the the, the low-hanging fruit so to speak um but even you know all major companies are somehow coming back from that because um you just have to be careful where you scrape the cost uh, off because if you're if you're left with just uh, just a bare stone, there's nothing. It's, there's nothing to protect anymore, and there's no business anymore. No. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for for your participation today. It was a very interesting conversation. I think at the beginning we focused a lot on cost effectiveness, but then sort of went into saying that value is more important. Um, 
uh, as well. Um, so I would like to thank you again and also for all the participants, uh, the attendees here. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please send them to me uh, and I'm happy to, to help with anything. Um, also, if anyone wants to trial Takama, um, you know, we offer both of you as well uh, a free trial if you would like to, to take up the offer, um, just let me know. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you again and have a nice evening. Gladly, thanks. Can, 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 we, can we say that Shirley and I were now cosmonauts as well? Yes, yes, <laughs> definitely. I really hope to see you at, at one of our events as well. Good, it, cool. Hopefully we'll have them back again in person soon. T thanks for having me. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victoria. It has thank been a pleasure. Thanks Bye. a lot. Well done. Thanks. Thanks.